I looked down from a broken sky traced out by the city of lights. My world from a mile high, best seat in the house tonight. Touched down on the cold black tar. Hold, hold on for a sudden stop. Breathe in the familiar shock of confusion and chaos. All of these people going somewhere. Why have I never cared? Anybody know where that's from? Two people. Three people. We'll come back to that. Today's lesson is First Samuel, right? The call. First Samuel 16, the call of David. And Samuel is worried because Saul is king and Saul hasn't lived up to his to his calling, right? Saul is not doing what God has wanted him to do. He's not following after God. And so Samuel is concerned that things aren't going to go right. And God tells Samuel, I have another king. And Samuel's worried that if he goes to anoint this new king, that Saul's going to kill him. Samuel's had these problems all along, right? Remember the story last week when we had the call of Samuel and he was told what was going to happen to Elijah, right? And then he had to tell Elijah. And Elijah said, if you don't tell me what's going to happen, everything that, that God says is going to happen to me is going to happen to you. So he was worried about telling Elijah. And now he's worried about going to, to find Jesse's son to anoint him king. But God says, don't worry about it. Because this is what you're going to do. Take a, take a heifer and go and worship and sacrifice that, that heifer to me. And, and call Jesse's family to come. And you will anoint the one... What does God say? You will anoint the one whom I, it says in here, name to you, who I choose, who I, actually the word there is, tell you to. Right? God said, go to the town of Jesse, and I have, because I have there provided for myself a king among, God, among Jesse's sons. I have provided, I have seen the new king that's going to come to be. And I need you to go and to take care of this. I need you to go and to do this. So Samuel goes. And what does he do? He calls Jesse's sons forward. And he does what? He looks at the first one. Who happens to be, the, not, not by, by name, not what was his name, but what was the first, who was the first son that, that Samuel saw that Jesse brought to Samuel? The oldest, right? Because obviously Jesse would think that the oldest one has to be the one that's going to be it because they're the, they're, they're the best, right? They came first. Right? All of the first children in the, in the, in the sanctuary are going, yes. And all of those who were born after the first children are going, no. Right? But that's the thought process. The, the first child is, is the better child, the, the one that gets the blessing. In the Old Testament time, right? The first child, the firstborn son is the one who gets the blessing from the father, is the one who gets two-thirds of the father's estate. He's the one who inherits the majority of, 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 the, of the family's estate. So the firstborn is better. So the firstborn comes to Samuel, and Samuel thinks, well, he looks pretty good. Looks kind of strong, looks like a nice looking fellow. So this, obviously, this has to be the one that God wanted. And God goes, nope. And so they bring the second one. And again, it's a nice looking fellow. You know, he looks, he looks good, he's strong, he's, he's, he's probably the next one. He's probably the one that God wants. No. And so Jesse runs his sons in front of Samuel. How many sons does he have? Seven. It's kind of confusing here because our reading this morning names three and then says that Jesse brought seven of his sons in front of Samuel. So you could think that he just ran ten children in front of Samuel, but he didn't. The three named are the first three and then there was four more. And Samuel says to Jesse, is this it? Well, the youngest is out taking care of the flock. But Jesse doesn't think it's going to be him. Because he's small. He's not strong. He's ruddy. What does that mean? There's one other person in the Bible that's that, 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 to this point that they've said is ruddy. And his 
his name just fluttered out of my mind. Esau. Esau, thank you. <laughs> Esau was the other person at this point who was said to be ready. What does it mean to be ready? I don't see any ready people here. So either you're hiding it or... No one knows? Do you know what it means to be ready? Red-faced. Red-faced or red-haired, right? So if you have red hair, you're ready, right? Because that's not a normal thing. Something different, right? Not bad, different. But isn't it interesting that once David comes in, verse 12, right? Because God tells Samuel, who's looking at all of Jesse's sons and saying, obviously this one has to be the right one because he looks like he should be king. He looks like he should be king. He looks like he should fulfill this role. And God says to Samuel, don't look with your eyes because that's what the world does. You need to look how I look. You need to look on the heart. You need to look beyond the outside appearance. And then David comes. And what does it say about David? David. He sent and brought him, brought him in. Now he was ready and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. You don't have a problem with that? Because God doesn't look on the outside. Why does it matter that he has beautiful eyes and he's handsome? Actually, um, biblical scholars want to say that David made scribes add that later. David made the scribes add that later. As king, he said, you need to update that to say that I was handsome too because this makes it look like I'm not handsome. Right? Because that's where we really go. We're really worried about our outward appearance, right? We worry about what other people think about us. Right? Kids in school, you get up every morning and you make sure you do your hair and you do your makeup. Guys, you do your makeup. <laughs> you put on the right clothes. Because you know if you don't wear the right thing, somebody's going to say something to you? If you can tell me that that's not true, I will be, I will be greatly happy. But I <laughs> guarantee you, even as, bless you, even as adults, we do that, right? We, we wear certain things so that people will see us and think that we're, we're, we're cool or we're part of the in crowd or we, we know what's going on, right? There's a, there was a study done recently about college students in their Facebook pages, and it says that these college students on their Facebook pages only put good things in their statuses. They'll never put anything bad that's going on in their life on Facebook because they know that employers look at Facebook and, and future um, girlfriends or boyfriends look at Facebook, so they never want to project a bad image about their lives. They want it to make it look like everything in their life is beautiful and that there's no problems at all. Right? That's the way all of our lives are, right? Everything's completely held together and there's absolutely no issues that we need any help with. Right? No. Because we always want to have that facade. We always want to have that appearance of everything is perfect and everything is great and I don't have to worry about anything because everything's all together. But in fact, it's not. And if we can't portray that image to this group of people, Meaning, the person you're sitting next to. How will any of that ever change? Stepped out on a busy street, see a girl in our eyes meet, does her best to smile at me, to hide what's underneath. There's a man just to her right, black suit and a bright red tie, too ashamed to tell his wife he's out of work, he's buying time. All of these people going somewhere, why have I never cared? You see, we want people to think that everything's perfect in our lives. And we put on that facade. But God is telling us here, just as he told Samuel, we need to look beyond what we can see. Right? You need to look beyond the outward appearance of people. You need to look beyond what people put out of you in, in front of you as a facade. And see what's really happening in their lives. And allow those things, those bad things to come to, to light. Not so that people know that we're all broken, because every last one of us is. Right? That psalm this morning, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and do not remove your spirit from me. Because every last one of us inside has, has blackness and darkness because of our humanness and our sin. 
And we need God to come in and wipe that away. We need God to come in and say that all of these things are, are not okay, but that you're okay in me. And that we can move together forward in this. We need to look at people the way God looks at people. We need to see people the way that God sees them. I've been there a million times, a couple of million eyes just move and pass me by. I swear I never thought that I was wrong. Well, I want a second, a second glance, so give me a second chance to see the way you've seen the people all along. This song is a song by Brandon Heath called Give Me Your Eyes. The video for the song has him landing in an airport and walking through the airport and just doing his thing, getting his stuff, getting out of the airport and getting on with his life. And as the video progresses, it has him going back through and helping people along the way. He actually saves someone. He helps a child find their parents. He stops a woman from stepping out in front of a car. Because we see things the way that God sees them. The chorus is, give me your eyes for just one second. Give me your eyes so I can see everything that I keep missing. Give me your love for humanity. Give me your arms for the brokenhearted, the ones that are far beyond my reach. Give me your heart for the ones forgotten. Give me your eyes so I can see. That's what God told Samuel this morning in 1 Samuel 16. Go to Jesse and I will show you the one, right? I will tell you. Don't use your eyes. I'll tell you who needs to be king. And if we could stop looking at people the way that we see them. And look at people the way God sees them. We would all come to understand how much, how great God's love is and how he wants to create in us clean and new hearts. That he's never going to take his spirit from us. That he's going to walk with us and restore joy and salvation in our lives. And that he's going to give us the willingness to go into the world to help people see how they're separated from God. And not correct that for them. But to allow them to see as God sees too. And know that they are claimed as his children, just as we are. So go into the world and look not with your own eyes, but look through the eyes of God and see those around you as he sees you.